You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, a life changing, life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. As you take your seat, tell somebody around you, we have a whole lot to be thankful for. I, was... Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to end this mini, this master class on parenting today. It was three weeks long, um, and then I'm going to jump into the completion of Ephesians. I, I think I, I told you I'm going to teach longer into the year than I normally do I normally break the first after the first Tuesday of December, but I'm going to teach through probably to December 21st or so because I want to get us through the book of Ephesians this year so we can start a new book in 2022. And so Ephesians chapter 6, I want to read the first four verses for you. Um, if you have it, say amen. amen. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction. Everybody say discipline, discipline. and instruction. Very, very key. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so I want to I wanna pick up where we left off. We start talking about the issue of children having the right message. We spent a week on that. Children having the right manner. And I wanna get into the last piece in our handout. But I want us to understand as, as adults why this is so important. Uh, Frederick Douglass and Theodore Roosevelt each had a similar sentiment. You've heard me talk about the sentiment of Frederick Douglass. We talked about it, I believe it was last week, the issue of it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. But Theodore Roosevelt, interestingly enough, had a similar perspective. L listen to this quote by him. He said, if you ever going to do anything permanent for the average man, you must begin before he is a man. And he says, the chance of success lies in working with the boy, not the man. And hey, listen, <laughs> it's a bunch of women mad at parents right now. <laughs> it's a bunch of men mad at parents like, what in the world were you teaching that child, right? So why this is important is because we still have time to correct some stuff because we still alive. And so I don't want us to like, well, I didn't get that, didn't understand that when I was a child. Well, we get a chance to correct it now that we're adults. And so I want to I wanna hang out with Roman numeral four now. And Roman numeral four is on a focus on the right master. We talked about the manner that we focus on, the message we focus on. Look at what he says in verse four. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction. Now keep reading. Everybody say, of the, of the Lord. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. So he's saying the motivation, the launching point, the springboard of how we view both instruction and discipline is based upon what God says. And this is the key thing. So that's why it's focusing on the right master, because he says, of the Lord. And so, so let me say something about this because the first issue that I want us to focus on about the right master is write down the word discipline. Everybody say discipline. So bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. That's very important. Not the discipline of society, not how people view it, but how God views discipline. Um, let me just say this. Whenever we don't discipline, whether it's children or adults, we're really setting them up for death. Um, and I'm not even just talking about physical death. You know, when I don't discipline my child on how to properly manage their money, as an example. I mean, listen, 
The only reason we have broke adults is because we had children that got an allowance that we didn't discipline them on how to manage their money. Y'all can say amen, at least now, you know I'm talking right. So any area that we're not disciplined on, it could be finances, it could be emotions. As a matter of fact, the text speaks to emotions because he says don't provoke your children, don't provoke your children, right? So there has to be an emotional intelligence that's attached to how we raise our children. And so whenever we don't discipline, and, and, and if you have margin, um, j- jot down, let, let me say it like this. This issue of discipline is about limits and love. So I'm loving you, but I'm giving you limits. Right. And it's not always limits, I'm also loving you. And we have to have the proper balance between the limits that we give a child and the love that we show a child. And so let's talk a little bit about this because when we talk talking about discipline, I jotted down four words in my notes that's not in your note sheet that I want you to jot down or, or to consider. And I think this is gonna be powerful for us as adults as well. The first word that I wrote down was conviction. Everybody say conviction. I, so this is important. The first word I wrote down was conviction because part of the issue of bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and that's why it says of the Lord, is to teach all of us what our convictions ought be. We sometimes care about stuff God don't even care about, right? When we, are, we, we have all these deeply rooted convictions that are not of the Lord. So I think the first issue for all of us, whether it's children, whether it's adults, is saying, God, what are the convictions of my life? What, what, what is my value system? What are the things that I should care about? What are the things that, that should drive and motivate my life? It shouldn't just be an organization. The church should not be the only one. The, the business down the street should not be the only one with a vision statement right. and a mission statement and values. Like we should grow up with a perspective of this is my vision for life. This is my mission for life. These are the things that I value and hold dear and near. So this issue of of the Lord, this discipline of the Lord, this instruction of the Lord is about conviction. But let me say a second word that I want you to jot down. And and the reason I'm giving you this, let me give you this blank real quick. Because what he's saying in discipline and instruction of the Lord under discipline is that all of us, children and adults, need both physical clothing and spiritual armor. I I don't just need sneakers. I need to have, you know, I need to be standing on the word. I don't just need to be clothed in terms of physical clothing. There has to be spiritual armor. So that's why he's saying of the Lord. You know, it's been a while since I said this, so let me just say it, and I hope everybody will hold near and dear to this, and I'm not trying to offend anyone when I say this, but I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make as adults is, keep, is giving our children an option on whether or not they go to church. Now, I know, I know what you're saying. Get out of my house, Pastor. It's not your business. Because many of us have this posture of, like, I know for me, I had to go to church. And when you grow up like that, it is easy once you become an adult and you become a, a, have a, you have, you become a parent to say, I'm not going to do my child like my parents did me. And some of you have, have heard me say this, but I want to say it again so we can be reminded. They have to live in the world. They have no choice. They have to go to work in the world. They shop in the world. Y'all not helping me right now. They, every area of their life, they go to bank, it's in the world. They go to food line, it's in the world. They, they turn on the TV, it's in the world. Which means if I don't expose them to another world, they don't have choices. So literally, by, so when, when you leave your child home, what you're saying is, I don't ever want you to choose Jesus. I don't ever want you to choose holiness. I don't ever want you to choose righteousness. I don't ever want you to live with other people in mind and heart. I want you to live like the world. Which is why, you know, I'm not trying to get in your business, but it's got to be if you're going to live under my roof. 
you gotta go to church. Because I want you to have choices in the Lord. Otherwise, you don't have them. So they need both, right? This discipline is a requirement of both the physical stuff we need, but the spiritual weaponry and armor we need to be able to make it through life. And, and so, so the first word is conviction, extra word. Let me give you the second one. The, the second one is concentration. The second word is concentration. And, and so, so this is important because I need to understand, you know, what I need to, you know, what are my convictions, but then, y'all, in life, it's easy to just get distracted. It, I mean, you know, you got clothing that's just around distraction. See, now, we, we just getting back, so I don't know if y'all remember how raw I can be. But I have to, like Ms. Naomi said, we remember. You know, but, you know, it's some stuff, y'all, that's just around, I don't want you concentrating. I mean, I, I'm not a woman, and I guess there could be a good wardrobe explanation for a push-up bra. But it seems like to me, it's about losing concentration. We have entire stuff that's around our children losing concentration. And as we go through life, we have to understand the things that are most valuable so that we can stay focused. Everybody say stay focused. It, and so it, we've got to have that ability to stay focused and it's easy. So we have to develop a discipline within our children to say, hey, we want to show you what to concentrate on. What are the things that are most valuable? When you go off to college, stay focused. When you get to work, stay focused. You know, when you're operating around the things that God is calling you to do, stay focused. So number two was con concentration. Number three is commitment. Is learning how to take the hits and keep going. Um, I just want to be really transparent with all of you. I think it took me until I was probably 35 or 40 years old. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not highlighting and, and, and celebrating my, miss, my, my, where I miss it. I'm being transparent so others won't miss it. It took me until I was 35 or 40 years old to learn how to stick with something. And this is the reason, because every time I didn't like it or it got hard, I asked to quit and my parents would let me. So I never developed a discipline of commitment. So when I became an adult, all I knew is if it gets hard, I can go do something else. You know, I think that's the reason to this day I can't sing. Like, it's my mama's fault. Because most people don't realize this, but I, I used to play piano, I played trombone, I could read music, and then I got distracted and I quit and I never w went back to it. And I just learned that thing after thing that got hard, I was just, I wanna go do something else. And I think it's so important for us as believers to learn the value of commitment. And here's the last word I want you to write down before we go back to the note sheet. And you're gonna be surprised by this, but this is nurturing and developing them in discipline, and then here is what he says, in instruction. So the third word that I want you to write down is curriculum. Develop them in instruction. Give them a curriculum by which they ought be able to live their life. One of the things that I love about the Bible is that there is nothing that matters to us that is not recorded in the scriptures. So I can read the Bible and learn how to manage my money. I can read the Bible and learn how to be a good husband or wife. I can read the Bible and learn how to deal with people. I can read the Bible like we're gonna learn next week and learn how to be a great employee. I can, I, all of that I can learn. So he says the curriculum for life is the Bible. That is the curriculum for life, which takes me to the second big point. 
It's not just discipline, but the second thing I want to talk about is direction. It is direction. And so he says, he gives us what our direction ought to be. So the two tools that God gives us are discipline and direction. Now, I'm about to teach through some things that some of you have heard me teach through before. But I wanted to spend time topically addressing this issue because I think our young people need it. And if as, as whether we're working in our youth ministry, our 18 to 21 ministry, whether it's us working in our small groups, if we could commit to some of these things, I think it can radically transform who we will be in God as we move forward. So I want to remind you of some things we talked about in the past and now taken on a form of a master class. So he says to the parents, I want you to instruct your children. I want you to discipline them, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, this is a very powerful statement because when he says bring them up, what he's saying is they're going to grow anyway. You know, those of us who parents have witnessed that they grow in any way. The issue is how do they grow? Do you want to direct the growth or do you want the world to direct the growth? Because no matter what, they're growing. So do they learn the right way or do they run, learn the wrong way? So I want to remind you of some things we've been talking about for years at our church. But now that we're coming back or are back and we're rethinking church and we're going through all of this growth process, small groups and all of that, I want to remind you of these things that I think will be very valuable. So you've heard them before, but I want to give them to you again in another way. So here's the first thing. The first thing under, I'm going to be several of them, the direction he's talking about of the Lord is that they need to be well read. Five, five amens, but that's all right. Because let me ask you this. How else are you going to know the way of the Lord unless you read? Right. I mean, it's just that the principal way God reveals himself is through his word. Right. I mean, yeah, we know he reveals himself through life experiences and the gift of other believers and all of those kinds of things, circumstances. But the principal way is to read. Right. So God is like, I'm giving you 66 books. So this issue is so important because I think I want to I want to walk us through what we need to read. And, and I've, I've shared these quotes with you before. Cicero said, a room without books is like a body without a soul. Mark Twain, the person who does not read has no advantage over the person who cannot read. So let me show you what we all should be reading. I'm about to mess up your Christmas list. Because listen, it's easier. Look how God works with all this supply chain issue we have. You can get books. You may not be able to get the latest game, but you can get some books. So let me talk about what we should be reading. Number one, as we discipline in the instruction of the Lord, as we instruct in the Lord, we need to have, be reading a devotional book. Number one, a devotional book. I need to read something, and I'm not just talking about the Bible, I'm talking an actual devotion book. Something that is going to heal my soul. Something that's going to speak to my spirit. And so whatever your devotion ought to be, I'm just I'm here to tell you, you know, it, it, life is too at you to not be grounded spiritually. And before we can, you know, and I can tell, you know, you can always tell the people with a devotion life. You can tell by the way they show up at work. You can show by how they handle a bad day. You can show by when something happens, they weren't expecting what's going to happen. What is their reaction? And so I think all of us should actively always be reading a devotional. Um, and I would encourage that. I would highly encourage that. And I would encourage it for our children, you know, for them to learn the power of, let me just take a moment and read a verse. You know, I have about three or four that I read daily, you know, and, and they're all different. Some are geared towards leadership and some just are geared towards discipleship or whatever the case is, but have a book of devotion. The second thing I need to be well read in is not just devotional books, but secondly, 
practical books. What I mean by practical is reading something that helps me develop a skill, reading something that helps me learn how to do something. I think if we're not careful, you know, I think this is one of the challenges of 2021 living. We live in a culture now you can just Google it. Or you can just go on YouTube and type in. And, and there is a value in just sitting down. Yeah, you could look at a video on how to cook that meal, or you could read the recipe. And so we should be actively reading something that develops our skills. How do I learn to be a better cook? How do I learn to build a website? How do I learn to, you know, I don't know if Joe's in the room, but you know, I mean, it, he's back there. I mean, like men need to like know how to use a wrench, <laughs> you know, and change a tire <laughs> and, you know, and so, we have to have something that is practical in nature. I got two more, three, two more. Number three, I should be actively reading nonfiction. That means I need to read something that's gonna cultivate my thinking, something that's gonna provide me with motivation, some biography or autobiography of some person that I desire to be like. Um, and, and so, I would just encourage, particularly young people, and, but like, and I say this to our young people when I have a chance to talk to them about what they wanna be. One of the questions I like to ask them is, what book have you read about someone that has done what you wanna do? And the reason that's important is because if I wanna be a nurse practitioner or an accountant, you know, oftentimes we don't know what it takes to become that. But when I can read a biography or autobiography on someone that's been on the journey, then when I get to those hurdles and those obstacles and those difficulties, it helps me recognize you're not tripping. This is just hard, right? And so it gives me a motivation, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of understanding. So I should be actively reading nonfiction books, um, books that help develop my ideology, books that help me develop my philosophy, books that help me develop my perspective about things, um, I think it's so key. And then finally, I know you're waiting when I was gonna get to this one, fiction. He, he says with a frown, because this is my, my weakness, I just don't read fiction for the most part. But let me tell you why it's important, because it can help cultivate our creativity. It can help cultivate our imagination. Um, and so reading something that is just fun. Everybody say, just fun, just fun. You know, and so the first instruction of the Lord is to be well read. Um, we live in a um, culture where mentorship is so important, and rightfully so. But when we study the scriptures and what mentoring look like throughout the scriptures, generally they were reading their mentor's life. And generally they were learning from the things they were reading in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the scrolls. And one of the ways that we can all be developed by people we may never meet is read what they wrote. Read stuff about them. And so this issue of being well-read is step one. Let me give you step two. I'm gonna go through these real fast now because you've seen, you've seen these. Number two, well-traveled. And that, and jot down, everybody say exposure. So it's about exposure. Because one of the ways that we, can that we can bring down strongholds is exposure. Because if I only think something, if I don't understand what's possible, 
When I can get locked into a mentality of can't do, can't accomplish, the moment I get to see it somewhere else, I get exposed to it, at that moment I recognize it's possible. And so, you know, I'm living that right now. So well-traveled is not just the issue of, you know, going to another city. It's an issue of literally transposing myself into another person's life. You know, I tell young people all the time, and this goes back to reading, but I don't need a ticket to go to China to experience China. I can learn to read about it until I can physically get there. And so this issue of understanding what is possible that gives us hope and motivation that helps us understand what God is able to do. Number three, well-read, well-traveled. Number three, well-groomed and well-dressed. Amen, I'm getting less and less amens as I go. So, we forget that part of the instruction of the Lord required some very clear standards on how men and women looked how they cared for themselves. And, and, and we have to recognize that sometimes people judge us by how we represent ourselves. It is hard for me, I would never be deliberately disrespectful of any person, so when I say hard for me to respect, I don't mean in the sense of disrespecting them. I mean in the sense of like, so when I see a person in public, you know, with pajamas on. I'm just thinking, you don't even care enough about you to get dressed. So why would I care? And so we, we have to recognize, and I'm not saying, when I say well-groomed and well-dressed, I'm not talking about, you know, suits and dresses all the time. I'm not talking about, you know, a certain specific kind of hairstyle. I'm just talking about act like you have some care of yourself. Amen, pastor. And, and so this, we forget that, you know, and, and I get criticized by this because now I'm too old to be the hip pastor. <laughs> so, so like I notice all the hip pastors pretty much preaching jeans on Sunday. They flip flops, sneakers, you know, that, that's just, that's the hip pastor. That's what they do. You know, Dudes are like preaching with baseball caps on backwards on the pulpit. Like that's what they do. And I'm not, I'm not knocking that. This is what I know. I represent God. And because of that, I want to show up like I represent God. Right? So I'm old fashioned. I'm usually in a jacket. I'm usually have on shoes. And so we have to recognize y'all that, that, that we represent God. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us as parents have seen our children put on something, about to leave the house, and you're like, you going out of the house with that on? And the reason we're saying that is because we're like, you my child, you represent me. And the same is true of us and God. We represent God. When I show up at Target, I'm still saved, and I represent God in that place. And so I have to have this willingness understanding about how I'm presenting myself, this issue of being well-groomed, well-dressed, because I'm learning that the way I dress is an indication of how I feel about myself. Um, And I think it also sends a signal to other people on how they should see me. Um, So I should dress my values. Amen. I should, you know, if it's not for sale, don't put it on display. Hey, right? Dress my values. <laughs> so, number four, I need to be well spoken. I'm going to put a plug in for the Martin Luther King Oratorical Contest. Um, this is now, it's me meddling, I want to admit. But if you have a middle school, high school student, I would encourage you to say to them, you don't have to do it every year, but you're going to do it one time. There is value 
in learning how to write a presentation and stand up in front of people and deliver it. And it is a value, it is a skill that will take people far. You know, my, my oldest daughter is graduating next semester, hallelujah, uh, from UNC Chapel Hill. And she interned this summer and the company she interned with immediately at the end of the internship gave her a full-time job offer, great full-time job offer. And um, we were talking about her performance evaluation. And one of the things that got her to offer so quickly was her communication. And our ability to know how to, you know, teaching our children, you know, when we go to the front lobby and we're shaking hands and we're kneeling down, shaking the hands of children, some of that is just teaching them the social skills of looking somebody in the eye and shaking their hand. And I can't begin to tell you how many kids, literally I've extended my hand and they might give me their wrist or the back of their hand because literally they've never really been taught the social skills of how to present themselves. And so this issue of just learning how to speak to people, I think is so important. Amen, well spoken. I'm almost done, two more. Well educated. Now, I'm not suggesting and you're saying, Pastor, how is this in the instruction of the Lord? When God creates Adam, he instructs Adam to tend to the garden. He instructs him to do something to contribute back to his environment. He instructs him to not be a consumer, but to be a creator. Which means in order to do that, I have to develop the understanding and the knowledge and the education to know how to contribute back. So I'm not suggesting that everybody needs a four year, six year, eight year degree. I am suggesting that God is saying, I expect everybody to contribute. In order to do that, I have to educate myself, whether it's a high level certificate, whether it's a four year degree, whether whatever it is. Because what is required of us is having the ability as believers to be able to contribute back. And that requires a level of education. Can I, can I, can I meddle? Um, so when I say well-educated, I mean developing the skill or the knowledge that is so significant that someone else is willing to pay for it. Right, Th that's the issue. And so, you know, I just want to encourage, you know, this, I'm, the Lord just has me in a very different place anymore. You know, I want to just encourage us, like, encourage your children and the children around you to dream, to know what's possible, and to know that they don't have to do it everybody else's way. You know, I just, I just want to say this, y'all, you know, the highest, the highest graduation rate from college, without exception, the highest graduation rate from four-year colleges are students who began at community college. The, the, for a child that goes right from high school onto a college campus, their five-year graduation rate is something like 23% or something like that. For those who spend two years in a community college and then go, the graduation rate is like 70-some percent. Here's my point. I'm, I don't get paid by National Education Community College. Here's my point. You're not less than just because you start in a different place. The important thing is to gain the knowledge. The important thing is to get the education. And so be well-educated. And then number six, well balanced. Now, I need, I need you, hey, you need a little bit of writing room, a little bit of writing room when I, when I say this. Teaching our young people the value of being our adults, of being well balanced. So let me give you some thoughts about what this looks like. Number one, the issue of well balanced is about teaching them the value of having compassion. Understanding that we should have concern and care for other people. That 
Everything that I become is not just for me, but having an element of care and compassion for other people, teaching them to recognize that part of the reason God puts you here is to be able to be a blessing to other people. Um, so just teaching them the value of being a good citizen, which takes me to the second word I want you to write down, is civility. Civility. Teaching them compassion, but teaching them civility. Teaching them to just be respectful of other people. Teaching them the importance, and we need to learn this as adults, that just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I need to be nasty with you. Like, we should be able to be civil with one another. I think one of the things that is just destroying our country right now is we just don't know how to be civil with each other. We can be different political parties and be civil. We can be in different denominations and be civil. We don't have to go at each other because we disagree. And so teaching them the value of this, teaching them the value of that kind of discourse. The third thing that I want you to jot down in your margin about this is integrity. <laughs> Man, just learning the value of being honest. Man, you know, the value of keeping your word, the value of not stealing. I mean, just the issue of integrity. Um, number four on your margin, and this is not a word, it's more of a statement, but part of being well balanced in this instruction of the Lord is teaching them and for us as adults to lift other people as you climb. As we grow higher, take somebody with you. Tell somebody, take somebody with you. That, I think this is so important that as we climb, we should be taking other people with us. As we go up the ladder, as we get promoted, as God opens up doors of opportunities, we should always be taking somebody with us. So climbing as we go. Um, and then the last statement I want to make as we close out today is service to humanity. Um, I'm so encouraged when I see young people, you know, helping with food distribution or, you know, helping in some capacity. Y'all, I want to encourage us to become adults that commit ourselves to service of other people. Because I know that's what God's desire is for us, that we might be of service to other people. Um, when people are at their worst moment, how, do, how does God use us to lift them, to support them, to serve them, to help them? So I want to encourage us to Take a look at some of this stuff that we've talked about. I want to add a group discussion question. And we've been talking about these now. This is the third week. Question one, what advice would you, tell, would you today tell the younger you? What would you tell you? If, you? if you're 50 right now, what would you have told you now that you're 50? What would you have told the 20-year-old you? And then what were the most valuable lessons you learned growing up. But I want to add one more question. I want you to take the list of well-balanced, well-educated, well-spoken, well-groomed, well-traveled, well-read, and I want you to pick one, actually pick two, and in your small groups this week, which on the list are the, is the easiest for you and which on the list is the hardest for you? And what are you willing to do to improve in the one that's the hardest? I want to encourage all of us about that um, this week. Next week when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about, starting at verse 5, I want to talk a little bit about this issue of how we relate to work. And then the week after that, I'm going to spend two weeks, maybe three weeks, teaching on the whole armor of God. And I know y'all waiting for me to get to that, but I want to make sure we cover some very practical aspects of, of what it looks like to be, to be developed and disciplined in the instruction 
of the Lord. Thanks for listening to Orthas. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. 